Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the painter Henri Rousseau, hosted by Wendy O'Brien. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Melanie Blake, and I'm the Director of Classical Pursuits. And I'm here today with Samantha Clark, Marketing Manager at Worldwide Quest, and of course with Wendy, uh, who is a leader for Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest, a teacher, philosopher, plant lover, art lover, uh, uh, interviewer tonight at the Toronto International Festival of Authors, check it out, and uh, a woman of many talents. Um, as I mentioned, she'll be talking about Henri Rousseau. Before Wendy gets started, I did want to share a few of the uh, activities that we have planned for you over the next uh, several weeks. So through October, October 31st, Worldwide Quest has a special 50 years, $50, to celebrate their 50th or the 50th anniversary of traveling around the world. And what this means is with just a $50 deposit, you can reserve your place on one of our 2021 trips. Uh, I know that 2021 is maybe gonna bring some of the same uncertainty that 2020 has brought. So the deposit is fully transferable. And we're having this special in part just to, the important thing is to get your get your name in there, right? Um, we won't travel until it's safe. Worldwide Quest has a plan in place, but we are going to travel again. And once it is safe to travel, a lot of people are going to be ready to go. So we really encourage you, get your name in there, get your interest in, um, so that when, when we can travel, you're ready, we're ready, and it'll... <laughs> It'll be amazing. I can't, I can't. I really can't wait. Um, until then, we do have a lot of um, online programs for you. This is the second part of Wendy's series. She finishes next week with her seminar on Lauren Harris, the Canadian landscape painter. Just a quick reminder: that seminar is on Wednesday, um, uh, Wednesday, October twenty eighth. If you have any questions about the change in time, uh, just let us know. And then on Thursday, October 29th, we are back uh, on our normal seminars, our normal webinar schedule with Sean Forrester, who will be talking about the arts and culture of Japan. And then Wendy and I come back on uh, November 5th to do a joint seminar on women in the Parisian cafe, uh, which was an idea from all of you. So thanks everybody for that. We also have a lot of webinars coming uh, coming up. Oh, sorry, I have a lot of seminars coming up, uh, led by Wendy, Sean, me, and and many others from Classical Pursuits. There's a hundred years of solitude. There's a seminar on Shakespeare plays. Uh, Wendy's leading a seminar on uh, two novels by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, you may know the Remains of the Day, perhaps one of his most famous novels. So, as always, please feel free to send any questions to us about the trips, about the special deposit promo, um, about anything that's happening at Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest. That's it from me, uh, over to Wendy. Thanks, Melanie, and thank you all for joining me this afternoon uh, to do a, a little bit more uh, armchair travel, uh, this time uh, imagining the wild. Now, if you were with me last week, we spent some time taking a look at the amazing detailed artwork of John James Audubon. He was somebody who was interested in the wild and who went out into the wild itself and documented carefully what he saw in ways that sometimes were, were complicated and raised questions uh, today about his method and his style. But his idea was, well, he felt the call of the wild and he felt the need to go out and be part of it, to see it. Uh, with Rousseau today, we get a bit of a different um, understanding or notion of the wild. With, with him, instead of, well, going out into the wild, we're going to spend some time dreaming or imagining the wild. I have to say, I just put this slide up and what an image, what a painting this is and and the story of how he got to create it and, and the, all the things that went into it is is totally fascinating um like me and like many of you i'm sure these days since we can't travel to the wild and and melanie i could hear you and you know we all want to be back outdoors we all want to be back traveling going to all kinds of places having new adventures well like you and i 
these days. R Rousseau couldn't travel during his time. He, he didn't have the resources open to him. So instead of traveling to the wild in person, he had to travel to the wild in his imagination. And, and man, what he created. Just, just, but, and we'll come back and, and look at this painting uh, called The Dream uh, in more detail a, a little bit later in this, uh, in this talk. But, but to begin with, a little bit about Rousseau himself and why it was he ended up having to dream the wild instead of visiting the wild. And what all this dreaming encompassed, what it was he was imagining and why it was so important to him. Uh, where we really have to start is, uh, well, here. This, this is an early painting of uh, Rousseau. This is called The Twelve House. And, and I thought it was a great place to start because that's really what Rousseau was. He was a tax and tool collector, a joinier, uh, which became actually his nickname through, throughout his life and definitely in the painting world. He uh, worked for most of his life at, at this job. He originally studied uh, to be a lawyer, but he got caught up in a series of forgeries and frauds, and uh, his life reads like a novel. Uh, anyways, he never did graduate from law school, but he did get this job as a tax collector or a, a customs service kind of clerk. And, and that's what he did up until, well, we're not exactly sure because, well, he wasn't exactly sure and, and documents are, are a bit iffy. But it wasn't until he was in his late 30s or his early 40s that he actually gave up uh, his job as a as a toll collector or well more accurately in his late 30s or his, in his early 40s by the time he was 41 in particular which would have been 1885 or so what rousseau uh, did was start to learn to paint and when i say he starts to learn to paint he learns by himself and for himself the amazing thing about Rousseau is he is a Nev. He had no formal training at any point in his career. And look, look at the self-portrait. It's amazing to think that he never studied with anyone. He got occasional advice from people who were members of the French Academy at the time, but really he learned on his own and by his own how to paint. And when you think about that, and you think about the fact that he didn't even begin to paint until, well, for sure we know by 40, the time he's 41, he's interested in doing work. Well, it's particularly remarkable to think that he produced something that looked like this. This is Carnival Evening, and it was the very first work that Rousseau would show. Now, he never could get his paintings. He never was successful getting his paintings into any of the formal um, shows run by the Royal Academy of Art in, in Paris, in France. So he showed this work at the Salon des Independents, which in um, 1886, which is when this particular work uh, showed, was actually um, curated by Soro and Signac. Now, this is his introduction to the painting world. And well, let, let me show you, because the same exhibition, the same salon, uh, a very famous work was shown. Yeah, at, at this particular salon, uh, Soro's A Sunday Afternoon on the Grand Jeté uh, was shown. And taking a look at these two side by side, uh, well, we get a chance to learn a lot about not just uh, Rousseau, but his place in the, um, in the French kind of academy, in the French world of painting, Soro was the talk of the town. And well, look at the images. Uh, this is a painting all about people. Look how big the people are and how small nature is. And look at the difference with Rousseau, how small the people are and how big uh, nature is. Well, one of the many differences. And then look at the palette, the colors that are being used. Oh yeah, Seurat was the talk of the town and this work, now considered a masterpiece, was 
was what everybody came to the salon to see and to think about. Rousseau, well, Rousseau's painting got laughed at. It was laughed at probably for a, a variety of reasons. It wasn't fitting with the style of the time. It was dark. It was, well, it was, well, look at the people. I, I wish I could bring you in closer, but, but maybe not is a good thing. Because if you look at them, you get a sense that, well, there you have a, a Perot, right? You get the sense that they're like marionettes, which is what Rousseau was aiming at in this work, but, but it wasn't what, it wasn't what people were looking for. And Duanier, it's when he really got that nickname. Duanier, the, the, the clerk, seemed to be the way that people snickered at his work. It was theater-like, it was puppet-like, it was dark, it was immature, it was childish. Those were the sort of comments that were made about it. But, well, I have to say, Rousseau had an incredible belief in his own ability, well, if not his own ability to be a great painter, his own ability to learn to be a great painter. And, and truth be told, he didn't have to paint this way. He, he was on to something. I, I think it's often overlooked. Uh, e even today, I was so surprised as I was doing um, some research, getting ready for our conversation this afternoon. I was doing research and I was surprised to see he's still sort of the lower class kind of painter. He was the wannabe painter of his time. And today that's still there. You know, he's not a Cerro, not a Signac. He's a lower level. And, and oftentimes it was, he painted whatever seemed to capture his at attention in the moment. That there wasn't a lot of thought behind it. Um, I think that's a misunderstanding uh, of Rousseau, uh, of his project. I think he did have a project in mind that gets culminated in that beautiful image of the dream that we saw before. But, but I think it starts here. You see, I, I, where I come from that or, or how I kind of developed that idea is by looking at the fact that he could have really painted in the style of the day in a way that was more pleasing uh, to the Parisian um, art scene at the time. So take a look at this, for example. This is his landscape with a bridge. And it's the earliest known painting that we have uh, of Rousseau. Uh, the reason I like this image and I like to show it is that, you know, he could paint in a different sort of way. The, the palette here, the colors are so different. And it's sort of a charming kind of country scene that he was capable of creating. Uh, he, he didn't have to paint works like the Carnival Evening that we saw a moment before. He, he was choosing to do this. He, he spent that back a, a lot of time painting the Parisian uh, landscape in ways that, well, as I mentioned before, I, I think would have been more acceptable or pleasing to, to the Parisian audience. For example, here's another one of his works. And, and interesting that we see here, it's that kind of peacefulness or the kind of tranquility that we see in the Soro from earlier. You, you see it kind of replicated in, in this image of his. Or, or we can consider this particular image. This one is so fascinating to me because we're starting to see him incorporating into his images of Paris and its outskirts uh, all the transportation, some of the changes that are starting to take place. And that would increase over time. Here's a, another one of his works. And, and I apologize that it's not a bit clearer, but the reason I wanted to, to show it to you is that when you're looking at these often overlooked images of what was at the time suburban Paris uh, and, and his downtown pictures. I'll show you a few of those as well. Um, when you're looking at these works, it's always important to look for the signs that are there, the, the signs of modernization, of industrializations that are literally kind of encroaching on the, um, encroaching on the environment that we're seeing. So here, for example, and I'll move my cursor in just a minute, you see the smokestack. You get this really kind of idealized life, but there on the edges, you know, is the smokestack coming in. 
always good to look for smokestacks, to look for telephone poles, to look for um, factories in the backgrounds of, of these sort of idyllic images uh, that he offers. I have to say, uh, of all of his um, city landscapes or suburban landscapes, this by far it is my favorite. And it was so funny for me to be talking with some uh, friends of mine and some of my kids, and I was telling them that I was getting ready for doing this uh, seminar today, and I sent them this image, and I went, wow. And they went, that can't be Russo. Um, you know, so used to the jungle scenes and so used to seeing the dream. This seemed to be foreign to them. Um, couldn't have anticipated Henri Rousseau painting an image quite like this one. Again, a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, again, you look at the, on the side here, you see the smokestacks. Uh, and then of course the Eiffel Tower in the background. And I think, I think he was, this painting in particular helps us kind of put into context some of the other paintings, his, his imaginings of the wild, the documenting of the changes in Paris and putting them upside against the imaginings of the wild. I think um, it, it's helpful for us to understand or, or to look at what was going on more broadly in Paris during this time period, during his lifetime. Um, more specifically, what I think it's important to look at and, and how to contextualize um, Rousseau's imaginings it is by thinking about the changes taking place in Paris as a result of, of this guy. This is Napoleon III. And, and you may know that when uh, Napoleon uh, moved from being emperor to president, one of the things that he did was he wanted a revitalization, uh, a rethinking uh, of Paris itself. Paris um, would be transformed under the hand of this guy. This is George Eugene Haussmann, sorry, Haussmann. Uh, and he would reinvent, he was given the job literally of reinventing what Paris, what the downtown in particular, what it would look like, what it would feel like. And, and I think this project, which started in the, I think it was in the 1840s, I'll double check when we have a chance to come back. I'm sorry, I didn't put it in my note here. Uh, but what Haussmann was doing, this transformation taking place in Paris is something that um, Rousseau would have lived through. He would have seen and witnessed what was going on. Now, why did Paris need to be transformed? Well, it had become a place that was associated with overcrowding, high levels of crime, disease, and what Napoleon charged Haussmann to do was to reinvent it, uh, to rethink what it would look like. The creation of, for example, um, boulevards uh, that we're so used to seeing, uh, the creation of you know, sidewalk cafes, the big avenues, the big sidewalks. I, I know it's a pixelized image, but I love this, uh, the thoughts of being there at this time. That was all under Haussmann's uh, direction. There was also the development of new architecture. Uh, this may look familiar to many of you. Uh, and also during the time, the building and the completion of the building of the Eiffel Tower. It was the time of a lot of change that was going on. And it was interesting because, and I've been trying to find ways to put these ideas together, and, and I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on it. At one and the same time, Paris was modernizing. You know, there was new architecture and new buildings and there was new um, industry coming in. And at the same time, there was this introduction of more and more nature into the space. And, and I sort of love this particular picture. And this is an early image of, of the base of the Eiffel Tower because at one and the same time, you see the metal and the structure of the tower itself, but then you see the greenery underneath it. And, and those two things side by side, intertwined or interspersed as they are in this image, I think that has a lot to do with what Rousseau was seeing and what he was responding to in some of his paintings. So Haussmann, Haussmann's reinventing, uh, Paris is under construction uh, during the time uh, that Rousseau is living. Uh, we saw before the 
building of the avenues and the building of the boulevards, the new architecture coming into place. There also was um, a whole new set of parks that were put into place as part of this. There were parks and uh, the greening of Paris was underway. And that was something that Rousseau was very interested in. Uh, for example, here's a, a painting he did in 1875, Landscape with a Bridge. And, and I can't help but think that some of what he was seeing um, both in Paris and in the outskirts, this, as I mentioned before, industrialization, modernization, and yet somehow romanticization, uh, the call to go back to nature, that, that he was kind of aware of both, painting somewhere on the line between those two um, different kind of impulses during his time. He painted images like this as a result, I think. Um, this clearly had something to do with those parks that we saw earlier, uh, and, and also a, a turn towards exoticism uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. And, and then there's this as well. It was something of the spirit of that time period, I think, that he was capturing there. But there was also, well, it's also the fin de siècle. It's the end of an era. And there's something about that time period that there was this great interest in what was exotic. Um, I, I wish I had a better understanding of what it was, but, but maybe it's there in those paintings we saw. You know, at, as we see the industrialization of Paris, its modernization, as we see this pull towards nature at the same time, maybe the exotic had a unique and kind of special kind of magical element to it. It, it wasn't going to be Paris. And if you think about colonialization going on at this period of time, if you think about um, the, the uh, military exposition, ex Positions going on during this particular time period. I think all of those kind of build into his response, his desire uh, to capture the exotic in his canvases on works like this one. As I said, I think it's a response to the industrialization, to modernization. I think maybe also it's a response to the kind of orderliness that Paris was acquiring at the time. Uh, I don't think we've ever done a seminar on Haussmann and, and the reinvention of Paris. So I know we've talked about the time period often. It, it might be well worth um, us doing a webinar on or you doing some research on. It's a totally fascinating movement, what Paris would be and what it was, where it came from and where it was headed. But one of the things was it would be orderly. It was the reorganizing of the streets. It was the connecting uh, of the left and the right bank. It, it was all this very careful. Well, I was looking earlier today at some of the grid work, and I was thinking about it in relationship to this particular painting. Uh, this is Tiger in a Tropical Storm, or it's also called Surprise. And I was thinking if that wasn't somehow what Rousseau was responding to, you know, too much orderliness too much neatness and tidiness. Maybe that was some of the pull of the exotic that we see in his work. For sure too, he didn't want the romanticization of nature that he was also seeing and witnessing in some of those parks that were created, for example, in the corners, in the, the neighborhood um, spaces created to, you know, with trees and a, and a bench. You know, there was a, a kind of romanticizing that I think he was responding to when he created a work like this. This, as I mentioned, is his Tiger in a Tropical Storm. It's also called Surprise. It was his very first jungle image. First, but wouldn't be the last, painted in 1891. Now, why the theme of the jungle? Where did this idea, where, where did tigers and lions and no bears, a uh, ha ha, come from? Um, I think a couple of places. I, I think he got the idea of painting the exotic first from Delacroix. Uh, we know that in 1884, uh, Rousseau got a license to be able to go into the galleries to copy work. 
And so that would have been a time when you would have seen Delacroix's work up close and in person. And person. Uh, this is his woman of Algiers in their apartment, a, a real move towards what was exotic, in this case, what was oriental. Uh, we see here as well, the lion hunt. Some of the ideas or images that, that he would incorporate, I think, came from looking at these works. And for sure, there's no question that this, a young tiger playing with its mother from 1832 by Delacroix, would have implanted in Rousseau something of that desire to capture the natural world, to capture what was in the jungle. That was probably one of the things. Delacroix was probably one of the influences on Rousseau's uh, jungles. But I think as well, in 1903, an exposition um, of, of Gauguin's work took place. And I think we see a lot of influence of Gauguin in uh, Rousseau's paintings as well. For example, you know, his desire to go to exotic places, his paintings from uh, Tahiti already in 1903 were well known and were being lauded. They would have been something that um, Rousseau would have been well aware of. And, and there's a couple of things I think that are interesting about the, the relationship between Gauguin's uh, wild and, um, and Rousseau's wild. And one of the things is, is that we see, you know, both the beauty, but there's also a darkness. We see a, a shift in palette. I'm just gonna go back for a second and you can see from here to here, the difference that takes place. And Gauguin both romanticizes and problematizes, I think the exotic in his work. You know, here, take a look at the look on the face of this Tahitian woman and we get a bit of that sense, but probably most clearly, that sensibility comes from this work called Where Do We Come From and What Are We and Where Are We Going? Uh, it, it's a brilliant, beautiful piece, but I think I see resonances in Rousseau's, well, in his palette, in the images that he captures of the natural environment. There's something there, I think, that's yet to be explored in, in detail. Rousseau would look at these works, and I think all of them, would come to influence, um, sorry, influence his painting uh, of, of work um, surprised, would influence his ideas about, about going wild, about what it meant to be in the wild. Now, when he showed this work, it wasn't particularly successful. Again, he was laughed at. And again, he seemed not to be taken particularly seriously as an artist, always kind of looked down childlike, an illustrator, you know, still the duanier in so many uh, artists and critics' minds. And maybe, maybe that's fair. And I actually don't believe that. I, I think he had an amazing talent for somebody who was self-taught. I think he had an amazing, um, idea in mind of trying to capture the wild. The wild, not just that it was on the outside, but the wild in terms of our imagination. But this wasn't selling. His works just didn't have an audience. So he ended up painting, well, more traditional subject matters with the hope that they would sell. And indeed, he was known to spend time on the corner playing his violin, trying to raise funds. And eventually, he came to paint portraits as a way of making some money. But his portraits were, well, never quite what people expected them to be. Um, again, there's a doll-like almost quality, a marionette-like, puppet-like quality to the images, uh, specifically his images of, and his portraits of children were disturbing to many, disruptive to many. So not being very successful, not having the money to be able to travel to the kind of exotic places that early on had captured his imagination. Well, I love the, this image. It, he, he wanted to continue to make images like this. I, I apologize. I don't know how this got in here so often. But, but what he did was he headed to this place, 
in, in order to keep making these images, in order to do a good job at them, he ended up going and spending a lot of time at the Jardin des Plantes in Paris. And this is what the Jardin looks like these days. In his days, it would have looked a, a little bit different. It would have looked something like this. He was preoccupied with the idea of, of the wild. He was preoccupied with the idea of the jungle, but unable to travel there, he was left with a couple of things. He was left with looking at images from books and magazines. Uh, he had a collection of postcards uh, that he often drew from, but most of his ideas and most of his images came from time spent at the Jardin. Time spent here when, well, for example, he would go into the glass houses that um, held a, an enormous number. I think I saw somewhere over 6,000 exotic uh, flowers and, and plants that were in the greenhouses at the time. When he uh, went in here, he wrote about the Jardin. He said that when I go into the glass houses and I see the plants of exotic lands, it seems to me I enter into a dream. He would go there and he would spend so much time drawing really carefully these sketches of the plants that he saw. But But it wasn't just the greenhouse that interested him. It was also, yeah, it was also a zoo. The zoo, um, again, sorry for the pixelization. This is an early photograph of artists who are busy painting at the zoo uh, and painting the lions and, yeah, lions and you got it, tigers uh, that were present. Yeah, he would take them and he would transform the images he saw there into the images on his canvas. Uh, lions and, as I mentioned, tiger. And he said when he was there that nothing made him so happy as to observe nature and paint what he saw. The tigers and lions that will fill his later canvases he took from his drawings uh, at the Jardin, as well as, I wish we could see this in greater detail, but this is the monkey house that was in the Jardin de Paris. Uh, and he would take the images he captured here and they would be transformed into images that looked like this one, images like his landscapes uh, with monkeys. Towards the end of his life, starting around about 1903 until his death in 1910, it was the wild spaces and the wild places that really captivated um, Rousseau. He would spend all of his time creating new kinds of jungles. Jungles filled, like I said earlier, with monkeys and snakes. Jungles uh, that were in these incredibly lush and lavish uh, environments. It, it's funny, I uh, was thinking a lot about this particular image from, uh, from Rousseau. Uh, this image, which is called uh, the snake charmer. And, and I thought it was an appropriate in, in image for him because he seems to be, you know, seducing us, charming us to enter into his wild spaces and his wild places. Now, as I say that, it, it's important to keep in mind his own advice, uh, a note he made to a critic uh, talking about his work at one point. He said, nothing is just itself. And I think that's such an important thing to keep in mind as you take a look at his images of the wild, at his imaginings on canvases, his travels with paint and lines and color and conversation. And um, it's almost like, I, I bet a bunch of you had uh, kids who might've done Where's Waldo's book, uh, you know, those, images where there was a tiny little figure and you had to look carefully to find exactly which one. Uh, um, Rousseau's jungles are like that. They require us to take time and look carefully for the details that are inside. Nothing is just itself. Now, in these late paintings by Rousseau, um, you'll find the jungle with animals at peace. Uh, I'm always stunned by the colors that he uses, the combinations of colors and the details 
uh, much like Audubon, the details in each drawing, what it must have taken, the time he must have spent on each one of these canvases. It's kind of remarkable. We see in his paintings animals at peace. We see in his paintings animals on the hunt. We see so much violence. Uh, and I guess violence isn't quite the right word. We find successful hunting. Maybe that's more accurate. I mentioned earlier that I think part of what Rousseau wanted to do in his imaginings of the wild, his images of the wild, was to avoid a kind of romanticization of nature. And so we do get animals killing and animals uh, eating. What we get here, you get the, the lion with the antelope. And you know, it wasn't just animals. This is a, a jaguar attacking um, what he called a black man at the time. Interesting to look as well at the relationship of those those acts of that, I guess I want to say instinctual kind of act of animals seeking and on the hunt in relationship to the natural world itself, you know, small in comparison to the size of the trees here, an integral part of it. You have the beauty of the flowers, the gorgeous nature of the prawns on those uh, on the ferns you've got those red sunshine and you've got the red on the cactuses that we see it, it's oh so beautiful that it's almost like you overlook that the attack is taking place it, it's just part and parcel of it and, and i think that that's important for him that it's the integration not to romanticize it but to see the wild in the fullness uh, its beauty and its destructive nature. I, I think that was something that he was always busy, busy incorporating and thinking about in and through his paintings. Uh, here's another one, The Repast of the Lion from 1907. Uh, again, the beauty, but also that there's this, in this case, the, a rather graphic image of the lion eating a jaguar at, at the bottom of, of the painting. Yeah, this was the world that preoccupied his imagination. And well, look at this one. This is a hungry lion throws himself uh, on an antelope. A and again, the violence that we see in nature or the instinctual eat and be eaten nature of nature. Um, this particular image was shown at uh, the Salon d'Automne in 1905. And he put with the image uh, a caption that if you let me, I'd, I'd like to read uh, because, well, you'll see in a second. Uh, he said, the hungry lion throws itself upon the antelope and devours him. Anxiously, the panther awaits the moment that he too can claim his share. The birds of prey have torn a strip of flesh from the poor animal that is shredding, that is shedding, I'm sorry, a tear. Now. Uh, partly, the reason I uh, wanted to read that caption that he put with the original, sh um, when this work was originally shown, is to get you to look carefully. Can you see the birds of prey? And more importantly, can you see the leper? Uh, I mentioned it's one of those uh, kinds of paintings. His jungle paintings required you to look carefully to find all that's hidden within it. Um, the reason, and the other reason I wanted to read you this caption that he put with the painting when it showed was because it infuriated Henri Matisse. Matisse had no time and no patience for uh, Rousseau and his work. Indeed, at the exact same exhibition in 1905, Matisse would show his woman with a hat. And, and taking a look at these two images side by side, I think is quite fascinating um, because we see number one that Rousseau was never going to be part of anybody's movement. By the time Matisse had painted uh, this particular work, he had already completed, you know, his masterpiece, uh, Le Bonheur, uh, and, and he had painted works like this one and this one. 
uh, sorry, this one, uh, Fauvism, this movement to paint like wild beasts. Uh, a fav is a wild beast. And what Matisse, along with Darin, whose works were also included in the 1905 uh, Salon, like these, and also a Vlamnik, it's sort of lesser known, the, the latter two are sort of lesser known fogs, but their works are amazing and, and deserve to be, you know, put right up there with those uh, of Matisse from this time period. The fogs, their idea was to paint like a wild beast. They had these bright, bold colors. What they wanted to do was to paint the way they felt just as they felt it, using broken um, brush strokes and bold colors to capture not what the world looked like, but to capture what the world felt like before we had thought it away and thought it into something else. Well, with works like these being shown, and really they were all the rave at this particular exhibition, well, you could imagine what Matisse thought of this, uh, a fav of another kind. Uh, the palette was so radically different. The image, he would derail um, uh, Rousseau at any chance he had. He would denigrate his work. He called it childish. He said it was nothing but an illustration. He didn't believe it should have been shown in 1905 with uh, the rest of the works from this particular group. But while Matisse was critical, at this point at least, of his images, others were incredibly flattering of his work. They saw in him something new and something different. Uh, for example, uh, Apollonaire, uh, who's the great poet from in Paris at the time, saw his work and was a huge advocate uh, of the images. This is a portrait he did of Apollonaire and his great muse. The other person who was an advocate uh, for Rousseau's work um, was Picasso. And uh, the reason that I'm showing you this work called The Sleeping Gypsy from Rousseau in 1897 is that when it was first shown, a lot of people believed it wasn't Rousseau at all, that in fact, that this was a Picasso. Picasso was always clear to make, uh, to make the attribution correct, but Picasso had a great admiration for what it was that Rousseau was doing. Uh, in fact, there's a story told that in about 1907, maybe early 1908, uh, Picasso is um, walking down the street and he sees a canvas and the canvas is being sold to be painted over. But the image on it, which was, unfortunately we don't have it any longer, but it was a portrait, it was called the portrait of a Polish man. Uh, the image captured his attention and he asked the person selling the canvas um, who had painted it and found out it was Rousseau and then went about um, to seek out Rousseau and to find out more about what he was doing. That's important because in 1908, a very famous banquet is held in honor of Rousseau's work. And, and at it was sort of the who's who of Paris at the time. You know, Gertrude Stein and Leo Stein and Apollinaire and Brenna Scusi was there. And it, it was a celebration of, of what Rousseau was doing. P Picasso saw something in his work. Now, Rousseau himself was never very good at judging his own work or his place with this group. And he at one point in time said, you know, Picasso and I are the two greatest artists of this time. He paints in the Egyptian style and I paint in the modern style. Um, might have been a bit of a aggrandizing, but it is interesting to think about his work again in relationship to that of Picasso, the similarities and the differences. Um, in the Sleeping Gypsy, for example, you know, I see a lot of some of the mask-like images that we'll see later in Picasso. Fascinating, fascinating. The criticized by Matisse, praised by Apollinaire and Picasso, no question about it. Matisse still seems to have a, a hold on us. There's something about his work and something that I think gets captured in this work in particular that resonates in us. Now, a few things uh, about the dream. Uh, first, it's hard 
to get any sense of what it's like on a screen. And that's not just because we're looking at a copy of a copy of a copy, but, but also because of the size of it. What many people don't know is that the dream isn't a small canvas. Uh, take a look at it here. Uh, here it is. We have a curator at MoMA where um, the dream is presently located. You know, she's using um, a, uh, um, a flashlight. She's dusting it. She's cleaning the work and use a tiny little flashlight. And you see the big floppy uh, duster that's there. Um, but the size of the work is part of its amazing quality or characteristic. This isn't a scene of the jungle of the wild that, well, it's not one that you get to control. It's in one of those canvases that's so large and so big that if you stand in front of it, it's like you get sucked right up and into it. You know, it's fascinating. Um, colleagues of mine who work in the sociology of art have talked about what we like to do with canvases is stand back far enough from them so that the tops of our heads align with the top of the frame. And the reason that that's interesting and to a philosopher of art like me is that it seems to me that we want to control the image. We don't want the image to control us. Well, when you encounter, when it's safe again, uh, for us to travel and when our museums are open once more, uh, when you have a chance to encounter this work in person, you realize its size is such that it's really hard to stand far enough back so the top of your head is at the top of this canvas. No, 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 to see, to look at this work, you become like literally part of it. We don't control the wild, the wild that he's creating here controls us. Or if you do stand back, you miss all the best parts of this work. Well, let's take a look at some of the elements in, in greater detail here. Uh, for example, here we have the woman on the couch who's in the corner of this particular painting. Now, the couch itself, the sofa itself, um, was a sofa that was in uh, Rousseau's salon. And people go, yeah, he just used it, it was there. But, but I think it's more telling of him. Again, it goes back to this idea that Rousseau has been poo-pooed too quickly, I think, um, considered a nev or a primitive, too quickly to actually understand a lot of what he's put into, the thoughts that go in and behind his paintings. This uh, couch was, as I said, in his uh, painting salon. And I think that part of what he wanted us to do and part of what he wanted us to think about, when you look at its positioning here, when you think about its inclusion, its size in the painting, is to think about how painting does transport us into wild places and wild spaces that sometimes we can't travel to any other way than through our imagination. Uh, it, interesting to think about the sofa almost as in a portal to wild places and wild spaces that transport us there. But, but that's just one element or aspect of the work that's worthy of a, a few minutes reflection. Uh, another element is, is here. It has to do with the siren, the musician playing in the background. Well, let's again get a little closer so you have a, a chance to see them. I think the siren is also part of something that Rousseau wanted us to think about in relationship to the wild, that it does call us. He himself pointed towards this in a rare comment he made about this work. He said the following, the woman is asleep on the couch and is dreaming. She's being transported into the forest, listening to the sounds from the instrument of the enchanter. There is something enchanting in the images of the wild that artists offer us. Um, if you could see, you can't because it's such a disaster, but if you could see my uh, office here, I have stacks and stacks of pictures and also of books of people traveling and describing what's in the wild. I hear that enchantment. I experience that enchantment. And, and I'm not the only one. 
interesting to see in uh, our time and in this place who many people have been buying, for example, nature guides and nature biographies, adventure stories. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating to see that there's something, even when we're stuck in the city, even when we're stuck at home, something that calls us to these places, calls us to these spaces. And, and two, there, there's more to look at here in this image. Uh, we got to look at, at these amazing animals that populate it, at the detail, and, and also the expression. I, I want to pull up one of these a little bit closer. Um, if you have a chance, and, and I wish I would have put them here at the same time, but there's something about the eyes in the animal and the eyes in his portraits that echo each other to me. There is a, a similarity. And how interesting as we look at the natural world, the natural world looks at us. As we look at the wild, the wild looks back and in, into us. Uh, I, I hope you can tell I am totally enchanted with this particular image, with two all the, the lushness of the flora and fauna that we see. I guess this is mostly flora. Uh, there's a little fauna there, but the flora. And he takes and he pushes his images of the plant life here in his jungle or in his forest. He pushes it almost to the point of abstraction. Uh, I know some of you were with me talking about um, Frida Kahlo's uh, garden. And I couldn't help but see a resonance between these two artists in the ways that they capture um, the plants around them, the similarities, the details that they spend, but details and also this push almost towards abstraction. And I know that sounds like a contradiction, but sometimes in order to tell the truth, we have to tell a lie in painting. And I think both of them understood some of that aspect or, uh, or element. Yeah, th this incredible variation and, and is burgeoning on abstraction in the work uh, that too quickly I think we can jump over. Yeah, Rousseau's dream. And I I've been thinking about why it is, it does stick with us, why it is that Rousseau's images do linger with us. Um, one of the curators at an exhibition of Rousseau's work that took place at MoMA said that what he thought that Rousseau had captured in his dreams were something of our own dreams as well. He says, caught up in his dream are the desires and fears of the modern world. And maybe uh, as we turn to, to answering some of uh, your questions, uh, maybe we can think about the way those two elements or aspects get combined in Rousseau's imagining of the wild and in our own. Yeah, for me, there's uh, no question that Rousseau is, well, this is the self-portrait that I started off with, uh, the self-portrait of him as an orchestra conductor. We're not really sure of the date of this particular self-portrait. But I thought it so interesting. He calls himself the orchestra, the orchestra conductor, but not in front of a bunch of you know musicians with their instruments, but the orchestra conductor in the natural world. Or maybe we're back to this image all over again. Maybe he is our our, our snake charmer, uh, getting us into the wild world to discover things about ourselves and the environment that we find ourselves in that perhaps we never could or, or would imagine. Uh, Rousseau, what can I say? Uh, what a, a beautiful image of him. Again, painting in front of one of his uh, later jungle images. Yeah, he gets us to think about and to imagine with him the jungle, but as we Imagine the jungle as we imagine his forests, as we imagine the wild. 
Well, it's this point where we go back to that quote from the curator at MoMA, our desires and our fears meet, where our worries about modernization and our desire to protect the natural world meet, where our desire to romanticize is put into, into question. Well, I hope Rousseau's paintings and some of my reflections on his work give you a chance to uh, do some imagining with him and to think about the importance of that imagining. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and, and your comments on Rousseau's work. Thank you, Wendy. Wow. Thanks, everyone. That was Imagining the Wild World of Henri Rousseau. And uh, of course, as always, we do have time for your questions for Wendy. Um, let me just get set up here. And while I'm doing that, Wendy, I want to say, it's. I was sorry to hear that about Matisse, knowing, I mean, he struggled for so long. He was so poor. And people <laughs> laughed at him. And he struggled for so long. And then he does the same thing. But he, he wouldn't be the only one, I guess. No, he wasn't. You know what? Nobody, it, he, well, Rousseau, I shouldn't say nobody. He did have a few kind of champions, but I don't know if it was because he wasn't schooled. You know, he didn't go, he didn't have lessons. I don't know if it was, you know, a time of this great experimentation, moving towards abstraction, and he was moving towards, well, I think his works are abstract, but maybe abstract in ideas, less abstract in image. You but mean yeah, compared to Matisse? Compared to Matisse and to, you know, Duran. Uh, so it is, it is very interesting, but also interesting to start to think about, as you, you were saying, what they shared in common. Uh, towards the end of his life, Matisse kind of came around to, well, not bad talking Rousseau. I, I don't know if he ever was flattering, but at least at least he was a little, I think he eventually didn't just call him the clerk the way he did uh, through most of his life. So yeah, it, 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 what a fascinating time though, right? With all these painters at the same time and, and the world of painting opening up and different styles developing and, you know, the relationship to that and what was going on physically in Paris, I think is is totally fascinating. But but uh, for another time, maybe. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get to your questions. So just a quick practical question that came up early. Um, well, Vonda would like um, the title of the painting um, with the two boats that you described as peaceful. Vonda, so you know, I'm gonna have to send you uh, send you that name uh, because the only way I can tell you the name of it is to lose my screen. Uh, but I will be sure to put in, isn't it beautiful? Uh, and so much, and I think all those kind of suburban, urban paintings he did of the anything but natural environment um, are, are kind of shocking to people when, when they first see them. It's not what you think of Rousseau. We really do think of those late, uh, jungle paintings uh, starting like I said 1903 till his death in 1910 that he painted pretty much uh, exclusively but yeah they're so beautiful so Vonda I will be sure that Melanie gets you uh, the name uh, of that particular image yeah I tried to look it up real quick and I just scanning a kind of a di directory of his paintings and I am just not Oh, I'm just not seeing it or else I'm seeing it and not realize that I'm seeing it. But we will, don't worry, we will uh, we will get it to, to Vonda and to everybody so that you can um, look at it more closely on your own time if you want to do that. Um, okay, so let me go back to the questions interface here. Um, okay, just lots of thanks and uh, compliments, Wendy. So th thanks again. Um, Question from Marlene about the um, above the dr dreaming woman in the dream. There's a figure yeah. among the ve vegetation that is the same color as the reclining woman. She wants to know what what that figure is. I'm gonna switch us back so we can take a look at it. Oh, up here. 
I think it's the plumage on a bird. Do you see the bird that's here? Yeah, Marlene, is that, if you could just let me know, is that what you mean, the this yellow plumage? Um, and I'll, so Marlene, go ahead and, and, and put that in the question. Um, in the meet, if, if, if we are, are we in fact answering your question? Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, let oh, me just I, see if there's a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Wendy, go ahead. Yeah, just while you're looking for the next question, uh, thanks, Melanie. But it, it is like, uh, I mentioned Where's Waldo? I couldn't think of a better analogy. Like when you start to take a look at all the fine details and the, uh, you know, it took, you, you kind of see the elephant here, but here's a tail of a monkey. You know, and there's a bird here, and there's an. Uh, I highly recommend. And again, Melanie is always so wonderful in sending out a list of resources. Um, some of the exhibitions that have taken place have amazing tools that allow us to look in greater detail uh, at these images and just what he encompassed, like everything that he was able to put into these, and to think that he never went to a jungle in his lifetime. You know, that these all came from the sketches he did at the Jardin des Plantes. They all came from looking at people, as I mentioned, like Delacroix and Gauguin. That these were really the composition of his imaginings is, I think that's just phenomenal. And, and it also gets us to think about, you know, what is it about these kinds of places that preoccupy our imagination? So thank you and do let us know if this is the the element that you were were asking she, about. she says yes yes it is yeah uh, um, like I said, check out ahead. check out the uh, tools that let you you do close examinations to see all of the intricate kind of details and all the hidden things inside this painting um and just a quick follow-up uh deborah says she believes the painting of the two boats is called the banks of the Waz. Oh. I will, um, that's a river, uh, obviously. I will uh, put the name of it here in, in the chat in French. It's a river in northern northern France, um, in kind of near the border with, nearish the border with Belgium. Go ahead, Wendy, sorry. Oh, I, I was just gonna say thank you uh, for, for doing that, for finding um, the name of it out. I, I was, while you were busy doing that, I was busy uh, looking uh, for the name of an exhibition. It was at the uh, National Gallery. Um, the exhibition was called Jungles in Paris. Uh, for those of you who are interested in Rousseau's work, I can't um, suggest more that you head to uh, the National Gallery of Art. Uh, and it's Paulie Rousseau, Jungles in Paris. Uh, they have their website still up uh, with an exhibition that they did, and it's full of all kinds of images um, that haven't been shown uh, a lot or haven't been shown at all. A lot of Rousseau's works are in private collections because he wasn't taken particularly seriously. He wasn't bought up uh, by galleries the same way, and so many of his works are still uh, not available for us all to be able to see in a gallery. They're in private collections. Uh, what the National Gallery did was they gathered together so many, they worked so many deals to put this exhibition in, and it is a marvelous website. Highly recommend you uh, head off there to take a look at, at those images. And I do Just believe to, that's sorry. where I found it, yeah. Just to confirm, Wendy, this is the National Gallery in Ottawa? No, this is... Oh, or the, in a different way. This is the British National Gallery. Ah, okay, in London. All right, let me just put that in the chat there. Okay. Um, and go back to the questions. Okay, a question um, about, uh, actually a little bit about what, following up on what you've been talking about um, from Rochelle, did, did Rousseau receive appropriate recognition and appreciation in his lifetime. So you hinted that he started to get some of it. Yeah, even the, the you know, the banquet that Picasso held, which, which was a really important kind of cultural event, as I mentioned, bringing together people from all different elements or aspects of the kind of new avant-garde art movement. Um, it, it's interesting to read the reflections on that banquet because some people thought that it was a parody, right? Like that. Uh, Picasso, in fact, was making fun of Rousseau. Other people said, no, um, Picasso actually uh, took uh, Rousseau's work quite seriously. 
it, you know what? I, I don't think he ever got his due by the artists of his time. He was, you know, he wasn't doing any of the isms that were developing. He was doing something so different and nobody really knew how to approach the work. And I mentioned before, the word that comes up over and over again in the literature is that it was child, not just childlike, but that they were childish, that these were illustrations more than they were paintings. So I have to say, he didn't really get his due ever. Um, and of course, the dream now is is at MoMA. And uh, I, I wonder what he would have thought, you know, if that there would have been some satisfaction for all those years of, you know, struggling and really struggling. Like he did play his violin on the street and do kind of random portraits of people to to try to, to, to survive. Um, and, and there's something, you know, the jungles, it, it's an interesting image, isn't it? Like the art world is, is a jungle of another kind with tigers and lions about to pounce. Uh, so, so it's an interesting, it's interesting to think about all that he's saying. You know, many people think that his jungles were, were kind of metaphors, that uh, it was less the wild that, that entranced him than the ideas about the wild and the various places you could talk about, like, like the art world of being a, a jungle out there, as it were. So I'm not sure the French would, would have a comparative analogy. Um, but another example for is that um, the jungles were a lot had much to do with colonialization. Uh, Freudians quick um, jumped on, especially the dream. Uh, this is the time of Freud, right? Oh man! And could you? He called it the dream, and it was like an opening up to all the psychoanalytic uh, critics that were were fast developing. So, you know it. it there's lots of different ways uh, of interpreting, a lot of different interpretive lenses that have been offered of it. I keep going that he really was captivated with being elsewhere and otherwise. I, I can't, I can't turn it into a metaphor alone. I, I think that 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 would be to to um, uh, denigrate the work itself. So I interesting, all the the various ways it can be interpreted and looked at and explored. Okay, a couple questions about uh, scale. Mm -hmm. Let me just, uh, I'm going to group these two together. So yeah. Jane asks, just any thoughts about the use of scale, um, for example, the hand versus the head in his self-portrait. Um, there was a por children in, against backgrounds of mountains. Um, any thoughts about that, the scale? And then similarly, um, where did it where did the question go? Sorry, I just lost it. Oh, I had another question. Um, oh yes, about the like the geometry of his perspective. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the his use of scale and perspective? Um, scale is a really interesting subject matter and uh, I think with Rousseau, scale is always important. I, I think you mentioned, you know, the children with the mountain in back, and I think that was that first painting that he showed, Carnival Evening. Uh, and I think it is important to look at the size of things in his work in comparison, because I do believe that he's trying to say the natural world. The world is so much bigger than we are, and we're puppets on a stage, uh, often performing for uh, nobody at all. Um, I think that looking at, at that, I think it's always important. And I'm not exactly sure, and I'm going to switch, and I think the question was from Jane. Is it, I'm not sure if this was the image to which she was referring about, about scale and, and the hand. Uh, that's the one I, I, I can't, can't exactly help with. It, and maybe you can point me towards whether this is the image or not uh, by, by putting a question in the question section. Uh, but, but the question of, of perspective is interesting because one of the things that uh, you notice throughout his work is that they're often very flat. 
And again, maybe this goes to Melanie, what you were saying earlier, Matisse's criticism uh, of Rousseau's work was that they were flat. And if you look at them, they almost look like paper doll-like images. Uh, and, and it's true, he did learn, he did teach himself a lot from illustrations in books and in magazines, and I mentioned his postcard collection. So perspective is something that you see him working on, I think, in, in a lot of his work. But, but I guess there's more there than, and let me think, think with you or think out loud. Why collapse the perspective? If he was capable of perspective, and for sure when you look at the Eiffel Tower painting, that you get a sense of, of perspective. It may be kind of um, a simplistic perspective, but you, you do have that focal point, that horizon, and you have a focal point, a point of perspective that, that that's working on. But I guess I, I wonder about our own imaginings of the wild and how much do we turn them into, you know, paper doll-like images, you know? How much do we flatten out the experience, it, it, whether just in our heads or, or when we're encountering them? And maybe that's what he's capturing part of, you know, that the fullness of the experience, the three-dimensionality of it. Um, I was interested reading um, some of his brief reflections. We don't have a whole lot of writing from Rousseau uh, about what he was doing or what he was thinking in comparison to somebody like Audubon last week where we have pages and pages and you know the autobiography for example of all the birds, the biography of all the birds that he was studying and you know he gives us the fullness of that environment, what they smell like, where they go, where they, how they mate, you know, we, we get a fullness in his writings, but we also get a fullness in the, the images. And we don't get that here. And how much does that reflect the fact that he went only to these places, constructed these places only in his head and, and didn't actually travel there? Uh, by the way, for a while, there were rumors that he had gone you know, to exotic places like Delacroix, and, and he had been conscripted into the army uh, for a period of time. but. And he knew people who had gone to Mexico, but but he never went there. Though so sometimes he pretended in conversation that he did. Um, so so I wonder about that perspective in relationship to a lived experience, about that idea of imagining the wild versus being present in the wild, and how those differences are being captured in the image. That's me thinking on my feet about these issues. Thank you for such a good question, though. Uh, just to clarify, Wendy, when you you, you mentioned Mexico, this is um, sorry, my earphones are yeah are hurting me a little bit. Um, this was the the French. Uh, this was like the early 1900 French misadventure with the puppet president Maxim. Just yeah, I, I can send a link. It, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a weird story. I can send a link to that in the follow up. This French misadventure in Mexico. Yeah, and how interesting it was a French misadventure that I think Rousseau desperately wished he would have been able to go to those places and he was kept mm -hmm. in Paris at a desk. And uh, uh, again, you know, the call of the wild and, and how the wild preoccupies our imagination when we can't get there. Um, ja Janice has a question and a comment, kind of her comment follows on what, what you suggested, Wendy. Or, or what you were just talking about that um that his job as this toll collector you know prompted his ability to dream and imagine yeah. um as he looked out as he kind of looked out on the same scene every day um, thank you absolutely right and and it was a world that was you know the industrialization even with the reinvention of paris it was going to be a a paris that was modern in many ways and so far removed uh, from the natural world. Um, and, and I think there is something about him trying to balance, you know, the romanticization. I think that's why he has so many animals eating each other uh, in these images or getting ready to pounce on each other in his images. You know, he didn't want to make it too nice. You know, he didn't want to overstate his case in some ways. He wanted to give us the complexity of, of the wild world. 
Um, and then kind of an open, we have time for a couple more questions, kind of an open-ended question mm -hmm. from Janice, and then there's a kind of a more straightforward question. So I'll start with Janice's question. Um, can you can you briefly um, speak to the names of other painters of his time who could also have us imagine ourselves in a place other than where we live? Ooh, what a good question. Yeah. Notice me, this is me uh, rolling through because so many of the painters, especially the painters of Montmartre, uh, where uh, Rousseau was located during this time, it included people like, you know, uh, Felix Boulard, uh, Modigliani, uh, spent, the, actually Modigliani and Rousseau used to hang out a little bit and think that's just fascinating. Um, uh, Duran we saw before, Vlamnik, so many of them were interested and stick with me on this again good question making me work here but so many of them were part of that post-impressionist movement that had taken hold starting you know with van gogh uh and, and cezanne and and that movement was away from showing us the way the world looked to showing us the way the world felt um, you know, photography and film fast on its heels had developed. And so we didn't need painting to show us the way the world looked. Instead, what it was going to do was show us how we felt when we were in, in the world. And, and really, that's where the fogs came in. They were, you know, expressionists, these immediate kind of expressionists of, of our emotions. And so many of them were interested as a result of that in the portrait you know i'm thinking modigliani here and and by the way i i mentioned there's so many interesting things and connections between artists that haven't been explored with rousseau that i, I think were, are worthy of some time and and i was thinking uh looking at this woman and looking at the eyes of the animal i was thinking oftentimes of modigliani's portraits uh in relationship to rousseau's work but they were so interested in the individual they were so interested in the person. They were so interested in going inward and in the environments that we found them, them, they found themselves in that right off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody who was, you know, dun, 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 off into the wild the same sort of way. You know, you, you have, you have a, 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 sorry, Wendy, a, sorry. Yeah, you got a, a bit in Matisse. A, yeah, and there's a well. There's a comment here from Anna Maria who says she has a collection of naive art of Croatia, and in wow. her encyclopedia she lists two names that I'm I'm going to mispronounce, but I'll, don't worry, I'll send them to you all in the follow-up. Uh, Joseph Generalik and Hlebin Jadwiga. Sorry, that I I don't know how to speak Croatian mm -hmm. at all, but um so um. Yeah, I will. I will uh, send a link to to those names in the follow up, and um, you know, uh, Wendy can you know give Wendy some time to maybe come up with a couple other names. Um, yeah, it's it's a really great question because, uh, and I hadn't thought about how interior the world uh, of the painters of Montmartre was, right? Like how many self portraits or portraitures mm -hmm. or uh, of the place. Like I said, there's a bit in Matisse because Matisse had traveled. But again, I think even when he does images of the world outside him, of, of the tropics in some cases, it's very much about how he felt in the tropics, right? In a weird way, they're, they're portraits of another kind, uh, keeping with this, you know, Favis kind of uh, I, um, school of thought. So thanks for the question. And yeah, you can see from the look on my face, I'm sure that you, you've given me a good one to, to think on and about. Um, one more question, and I know we have a few we didn't get to, but um, I will answer them in the follow-up. Uh, just kind of a, um, a straightforward question from Peggy. Um, is there a biography of Rousseau that you would recommend? Oh, do you know what? There's not enough research on Rousseau, generally speaking. Um, I, I was really scrambling to find uh, resources uh, as I was uh, researching for for today, and, and I and I have to say, there's there are books out there that are, look fantastic, but um, are no longer in print or 
have limited availability. Um, Tashin has a book on, you know, the, the good old Tashin, uh, has a book on Rousseau uh, that, that at least is available. Uh, MoMA has a book on the dream in particular uh, that you can order uh, from your store. But in terms of a, a good biography, I got nothing for you, Peggy. Well, so let's, uh, well, Wendy, we'll put our heads together and see if we can, we can yeah. find something. Um, and Deborah does recommend a play about Rousseau that I will include for everybody in the follow-up. So thanks, Deborah. Um, but yeah, we should, we should end it there. Um, cause I know Wendy, uh, has, is, uh, I know you're going to be busy tonight. Um, and I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, Wendy is interviewing two authors at the Toronto International Festival of, of Authors tonight at, I believe it's 9 p.m. Toronto time. Is that correct? Yeah, it um, is. So I put the link uh, here in the chat. Uh, feel free to, um, to go to that interview. And um, again, we'll follow, I'll, have, I'll, have, I'll try to have my follow up for all of you in the next couple of days and see you next Wednesday not thursday um well okay see you next wednesday and thursday i hope so next wednesday wendy finishes the uh into the wild series with the canadian landscape painter lauren harris and then so that's on wednesday and then on thursday uh sean forrester talks about the arts of japan again any questions or any you know anything you need to know or you're not sure if you registered uh please feel free to contact samantha or me and we will help you out um Thank you so much, Wendy. I learned, I knew very little about Rousseau and, and, and had seen very few of his paintings and found this really fascinating. Oh, I think Wendy froze. Okay, there you go. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, thank you so much to everybody. Uh, what, a, uh, what a joy it was to, to bring his work. And, and like I said, you know, I think there's uh, much work to be done on Rousseau. So, uh, uh, you know, keep looking. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Goodbye.